Harvard Surgeons General was born Minnie Lee Jones on August 13, 1933 in Shaw, Arkansas, the oldest of eight children in a poor sharecropping family. She knew little about and had little access to doctors, health care, or sex ed. And in her autobiography, she wrote, children were told that babies were brought by storks or that they came from swallowing watermelon seeds. As youngsters, we spent a lot of time trying not to swallow a watermelon seed. Teen pregnancy was all too common, and these early experiences, along with intense academic study, would later lead to her conclusion that not allowing poor black women and men to access reproductive health care and sex ed was a form of oppression. But first, how did Dr. Joycelyn Elders even become the first black and second female Surgeon's General? In high school, she was valedictorian and won a full scholarship to Philander Smith College, where she earned a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and became a Delta. She worked as a maid during her time there, describing it as a lot easier than chopping and picking cotton. She joined the Army in 1953, wanting to take advantage of GI Bill benefits so she could become a doctor. She served for three years and went on to get her MD from University of Arkansas Medical School in 1960. She completed a pediatric residency at the University of Arkansas Medical Center and then an MS in biochemistry. An April 1964 issue of Ebony Magazine described her as an attractive 30-year-old farm girl who supervised all the resident doctors and interns in the pediatric service of the Integrated University Hospital. Whew. And Joycelyn was not finished racking up the expertise that often went ignored by her white peers. In 1978, she was the first person in the state of Arkansas to receive certification as a pediatric endocrinologist. Eleven years later, Governor of Arkansas Bill Clinton made Elders the director of the Arkansas Department of Health, the first black woman in this position. The best part is that she had criticized Arkansas's Department of Health for years. When she stepped in, she helped to reduce the teen pregnancy rate with her comprehensive approach to sex ed in schools, along with birth control and counseling at school clinics. She also sought to increase increased AIDS and STD awareness and testing. In January 1993, President Bill Clinton made her the U.S. Surgeon General, the first black person and second woman to earn this position. The president of the anti-abortion organization, the National Right to Life Committee, said at the time, it's ominous to see her in a position of so much authority. Her appointment was controversial for many conservatives who called her the condom queen and despised her pro-choice statements. They called her the condom queen because she advocated for teaching teens how to safely use condoms condoms during sex. She once said, they love little babies as long as they're in somebody else's uterus rather than caring about children after they're born. Conservatives battled her nomination fiercely, and she even got death threats, but they were ultimately defeated. Dr. Elders was a gifted speaker who was known for stirring up emotions from her audience, while also delivering solid facts that backed her claim. She was especially passionate about advocating for comprehensive sex ed, which earned her frequent bullying from conservative radio host Rush Limbaugh. Though it's also worth noting, Joycelyn was also criticized by conservative black Americans. What pissed people off about elders, even more than her pro-choice and pro-sex ed beliefs, was her 1993 suggestion that legalizing drugs could reduce crime, and that this theory deserved to be studied. Let's just say she was way ahead of her time. Clinton's press managers distanced him from Joycelyn as people called for her firing, and less than two weeks later, her 28-year-old son Kevin was arrested for allegedly selling cocaine to undercover agents. Elders believed he was framed, but continued her public speaking and also put out a report on kids and smoking that called for government regulation of tobacco. A 1994 profile by the New York Times mentioned she kept a bouquet of condom roses on her desk. Her frankness continued to put people off. And when Republicans gained control of the Senate for the first time since 1986 in the 1994 midterm elections, the chorus of conservatives calling for her resignation grew louder. The final straw for Bill Clinton came on World AIDS Day on December 1st, 1994, when elders responded to a question about masturbation by saying that comprehensive health education started at an early age and that masturbation is a part of human sexuality and should perhaps be taught. Wow, how scandalous. Conservatives and neoliberals were outraged when the news was reported days later. On December 9th, it was announced she was leaving the administration. Dr. Elders didn't originally want to resign, knowing that her appointment was for four years years and that Clinton couldn't technically fire her, but he could cut her budget, icing her out from conducting research and traveling for public speaking. After resigning, she continued her career as a professor of pediatrics at University of Arkansas and continued to speak her mind. I will always admire Dr. Joyce
Joyce Lynn Elders because she was smart and driven as hell, but also because she kept it realer than real in front of the entire nation, enduring verbal attacks, racism, and the lies of socially conservative Americans who refused to acknowledge the need for comprehensive sex ed.